Hello everybody, my name is Induity and amazingly I can record buried on this laptop so this is the first time I'm using this cubicle. So let's get in. I open my eyes and the first thing I want to do is scream. I'm flat on my back and everything seems to hurt. The trees overhead look familiar, it's a clear night sky, almost beautiful. Except for the fact that this means I've been out cold for at least six hours. But there's something wrong. I don't remember what, but something happened and my head, my God, my head hurts and, and a ringing in my ears. Was there an accident? An explosion, I think. I remember Dennis screaming, but after that, I can't remember. As I sit up, I notice that my hard hat has been thrown off. I look around the area, but it's not there. It feels strange to go anywhere without my hat, hard hat. But I've got to find the other members of the crew. They should be in danger. Well, let's get the hard hat back. I get up on shaky legs and look around for a moment. A few near nearby trees look to have been splintered and broken at the base, at the base recently. They certainly weren't like this earlier. Searching for the hard hat feels normal. It makes me feel like maybe there isn't something wrong here. I see it behind a fallen log, about 10 feet away from me. How it was thrown so far is beyond me. Driven by nothing more than habit, I walk over to it, pick it up and place it on my head. Next, I walk over to the center of the logging site and don't, and don't like what I see. Okay, so we've got the hard hat now. The logging site looks like a bomb has detonated right in the center. I don't know where to start. The one load we had managed to stack on the truck for a day is overturned. The trailer bent and the logs hanging off the back. Where the hell is everyone? My head is killing me and this ringing in my ears. I can't hear anything. No birds, not my footsteps, nothing. It makes me wonder if I hit my head after my hard hat flew off. I run through a quick mental checklist to make sure my brain is still working. My name is Roger Hastings. I'm 41 years old. The year is 2017. I own a small logging company and we've been logging in the strip of Kentucky Woodland for almost a month now. Okay, so my brain works. That's a relief. But it also makes me fearful because something is certainly not right here. I look around the logging site, my mind trying to figure out what, what, what has happened. Just about every piece of equipment has overturned or tilted. Okay, so obviously we can see the truck right now, so let's rather just look at the debris. There are bits of debris everywhere. There are fragments of the five gallon bucket I keep our work rags in. A loose sword chain and an overturned gas canister. Had there been an explosion, all of that fuel on site would, would have set a fire, but there's no charring, no burning, nothing. I walk through the area where Dennis had been working. From the looks of it, he'd been moving slowly. He'd only taken down four trees today. His metal lunch box was open and indicated that he had been taking an early break. But he's not here. No one is. Where the hell is everyone? I could try to make a call on my cell phone, but his battery is already running low. Not that it matter not, not that it matters. The reception here is crap out the reception is crap out here. Well let's yell out. It's not gonna waste the battery. Hey guys, where is everyone? Tony, Dennis, Frank, Joe. That's four random names, but the names fall flat among the wreckage. I get nothing back other than scaring away a few birds overhead. Might as well start walking and try to find someone and try to find some answers. The highway is almost a mile back through the woods, down the gravel road we used to reach the site. Maybe the crew ran that way for help. But why would they have left me? Were they scared? Out of sorts? Maybe I can catch up to them. But with my truck turned over on its side, it, it looks like I'd be walking. My god, I can't even remember what I was doing before waking up on my back. Wait, what's that un underneath the bulldozer? My god, it's a leg. It has to be either Tony or Dennis. The, the dozer looks, un it looks unstable. Like it might roll out. Oh, <laughs> Like it might roll some more. It might not be safe to get close, but at the same time, I can't just leave him there. Oh, I'm not gonna go near that thing. There's no use putting myself at risk. That thing could tumble again. It's pretty clear that he didn't survive. 
Damn. He had two kids too, both sons. In my shock, I stumbled back, suddenly tripping over a stray log behind me. The hard and rain collides with it as it fall, doing its job. Thank goodness. Thank goodness. Um. Uh, collides. Okay. But that's more startling is realization that Tony is dead. I can't stay there. I have to find Dennis, Frank, and Joe. I have to find out what happened here. Well, let's continue. Okay, so let's continue. As I walk through the stacks of logs from the last week or so of work, everything feels frozen. This high-pitched sound in my ears is terrible. It keeps happening every few seconds and sounds like it's coming from far away. I can't help but wonder, is it my ears or is it some something else? The silence out here is creepy and there's a smell, like the atmosphere after a bad summer storm. I might as well admit it, I'm a little scared. Everyone is missing and is dead quiet out here. There doesn't even seem to be a breeze to rustle the leaves and branches. My right knee hurts like hell, my head was hurting so bad before that I never even noticed the pain in my knee. I must have heard it during the, well, during the what? Accident? Or... Wait, is that Dennis? I see him sitting on the ground, motionless, about 30 feet away. Let's yell out. Dennis! I yell. Dennis, can you hear me? Dennis lets out a shout like someone waking from a nightmare, then looks back at me from the ground. Yeah, Roger, I hear you. He hollers back as, he's, as I head over to him. Dennis is built like a wrestler and he has the tough personality to match. But in this moment he looks disoriented and even a little anxious. Though I'm glad to see him. The fear on his usually confident face is alarming. What the hell happened? What's going on? He asks. I don't know. The crew is missing. Missing? Dennis says. Where do you think they went? I'm not sure, I say. But he was. he has me pretty freaked out. Something's not right here. Still sitting on the ground, he looks around the woods as if he, as if he's just now understanding the severity of the situation. The equipment is overturned. The dozer is too. I say, shifting my hard hat and wiping my forehead. You okay? I ask him. Yeah, just shaken up. Me too. This might be the most intimate conversation Dennis and I have ever had. While he had, while he and I have always been on good terms, we've never been practically close. Particularly close. I've always respected him, though. Sure, he's come to work a few times looking like he'd been in a bar fight the night before, but I've always seen him do an enthusiastic impression of a dinosaur as he played with Tony's kids while, while they waited for their dad to finish up his shift. It's then that it hits me. Dennis and Tony were good friends. I'm not sure I want to be rattling with the news of Tony's death right now, not before we know what's going on, but he has, he has the right to know. Yes, he does. Tony is dead. Up front with Dennis about Tony. Dennis' eyes fixate on me, startled. He, he was crushed under the dozer, I say. Dennis pauses for a moment, like he's trying to understand what's at, what I said. His eyes narrow and his bottom lip quivers. Shit, he says. And I can tell that, he's, that he is fighting back tears, and Tony had been tight, almost like brothers. Hey, he adds quickly, as if trying to escape the reality of Tony's death. Did you see that light? No, I say. What did you see? I don't even know, Roger, he says. It was like this flare of white light that came right up out of the ground, like an explosion. So there was an explosion, I say. Maybe it was some equipment or... This was no equipment, Dennis interrupts. Agitated. This huge ball of light came right out of the damn ground. Okay, well, where did it go? It just shot up into the sky until it was out of sight. When? I'm not sure he answers, but I had finished about 10 trees for the day and was about to top one. That's when it happened. You were almost done with 10 trees, I ask? Yeah, he says, looking at the ground. You know, I wouldn't want to take a lunch break until it was done. And that's when the light blew up. Why? Why? You don't believe me? Just checking. What is that? Three minutes? Yeah. Um, well, I believe you. You believed Dennis' story. He saw, he saw what he saw. I think to myself, he has no reason to lie about this. My God, are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine, he says. But if I'm being honest, it scared, it scared me pretty bad. 
And if it's all the same to you, I'd like to get the hell out of here. We both stand up and start heading towards the road. It isn't until we start moving that I see Dennis is wounded. His right side is coated in blood, the red seeping through his blue work shirt. There are splatters of it here and there, but also a very large red splot that makes me worry. We're in a lot of pain? Well, obviously, if it's that bad. So, how'd you get the injury? I'm not sure, Dennis replies. I must have been, uh, must have gotten thrown, hurt, thrown or hurt somehow from that light. It's then that I notice that the strange ring noise is still flinging in the air. Hey, I say stopping. Do you hear that high pitched ring noise every once in a while? Dennis looks scared when I ask him this question and he just nods. I thought it was just me, he says. Looks out of the sorts and uncertain. I've never seen him like this before. It's obvious that he's looking for some reassurance. Even though I'm his boss, there's something very unnerving about this. We'll be okay. It's probably nothing. Yeah, it is probably nothing. It's probably just, you know, like the explosion or something. Let's be realistic, I tell myself. I might as well try to be em empathetic. Out here in the middle of these woods, the ring could be anything. Maybe a car alarm from through the roots or something. Still, even my passive comment seems to have reassured Dennis. He looks a bit calmer, more relaxed. Both start moving forward and don't say another word. We both, okay. Did I try to call did you try to call Frank? Dennis asks. I know we had the cell on him today. Not yet. Luckily I still have some battery left. I pull out my cell and call Frank. Happy I didn't make that call to Dennis earlier. Thank goodness. It rings, but he doesn't pick up. But then I hear his phone go off, behind the stack of logs. Dennis and I give each other a look. As the phone goes to voicemail, I, I hang up. And we walk behind the logs to find Frank's phone on the ground, abandoned. We look around for Frank, but nothing, not a single trace. It's then that I notice something really odd. A ten foot wide hole in the ground, right near where the phone was. But there's no stray piles of removed dirt or rocks. It's clean, smoothly dug, cutting into the earth. Why, but only a few feet deep. Only a few feet deep. It looks unnatural, like the ground was deleted. No shovels or diggers used. Dennis walks over to it. This looks like the same kind of hole where I saw that light come from the ground. He, he musses to himself. I say nothing, my mind's spinning, but I don't know what to think. We need to get out of here, Dennis mutters. At that moment, that ringing noise carries through the forest again, sending a shiver down my spine. Dennis is right, there's something strange going on, and we might not be safe here. But that ringing sound could be a clue to wherever the rest of the crew went. Okay, well, I think it's nothing. So I think, you know, let's just get it as far as possible away from this place. We decide to avoid the sound. With that, we turn and start walking to the west, in the direction that I'm pretty certain leads the road. Let's continue. It's sort of embarrassing. I've been a logger for nearly 15 years, but I'm finding it easy to get lost in these woods. The trees are so, th are so thick in places that the moonlight doesn't even reach the ground. It's easy to get turned around. My only hope is that I can find the overgrown dirt road that will lead us back to the highway. You sure, we're, you sure we headed the right way? Dennis asks. Pretty sure, I say. I turn to him and see that he's clearly in pain. It's at this moment that we come upon another one of these smooth holes. This one is even stranger because a nearby tree also has a chunk out of it. A chunk cut out of it. The arc goes smoothly through the ground and then up th through the trunk like a cartoon wrecking ball blasted through both of them. What the hell are these things? Dennis whispers to himself. He takes a step down into the hole, his boots creating imperfections in the shape, like footprint footprints in the sand dome. Well, you know, while he's exploring that side, I think a perimeter will do us good. I walk along the edge, each step sending pebbles down into the hole and ruining its perfect shape. I'm amazed at how smooth it is. Even rocks that were under the earth have been seared to fit the spherical shape. But as I'm noticing this, I notice Dennis's feet start to sag. Dennis!
we're back. So, the fall isn't a long one, but when I hit something a few seconds later, it hurts like hell. Wind goes rushing out of me when I hit, and a sharp pain flies through me. What the hell, I say once we, once my breath is back. Beside me, Dennis is slowly rolling over to get to his feet. I look up and see the hole in the ground where we fell through. It looks like to be about 10 feet over our heads. It's completely dark, but there's a small flicker of light further into the cave ahead of us, and a solid wall of rock behind us. Looks like the only way, looks like the only way is out of further down the cave, or up through the way we fall in. Dennis might be able to boost me up there, but with his injury, I'm not sure how stable he is. He might drop me. Yeah, I think let's just head into the cave. Go. I decide we better not risk hurting ourselves trying to climb out. As we turn to head into the cave, I take a closer look at the light further ahead and realize it's artificial. We both start heading towards it instinctively. As we step into the light, panic gently gnaws at me because what I'm seeing makes absolutely no sense. It's no, it's no longer a cave or hole. It's a long, sparsely lit corridor. Well, that. It's scary. Uh, I'm just checking. Okay, eight minutes. <laughs> Let's continue. It's a massive corridor. In fact, it's it seems to go on forever. This corridor is mostly dark, with emergency lights every ten feet or so. I turn to my left and see that there's a door which appears to lead upwards to the outside, but it's locked tight. I push as hard as I can, but no luck. Let us help you with this, I say. He comes over and we both try to kick the door open, but doesn't budge. For some reason, someone doesn't want people getting out of here. Looks like we're headed down the hallway. Well, it is long, so I don't know why I go quiet. I'm eager to figure out what's going on here. Our footsteps echo loudly in the dust and the dirt. Dennis leans on me for support. If there is anyone here, it's not, li it's not like we're trying to be quiet and stealthy with the intention of sticking up on them. If anyone is listening, they definitely know we're here now. As I carry Dennis to the far end of this otherwise featureless place, I see a flight of concrete stairs leading down. I have to see Dennis down on the floor. He's, his weight is killing me. Dennis, are you okay? Stop worrying, man, he says. I'll be okay. I just need a minute to rest. But looking at him, I'm not so sure. I can still hear the ringing noise every so often coming from somewhere in here. I look ahead at the concrete stairs, pointing towards them so that Dennis sees them. Can you make it down those stairs, I ask? He stands up slowly and is visibly making an effort to not fall back down. Yeah, he says, and sounds like a, and sounds a little irritated. He, start, he, st he starts for the stairs without me and I've, I, and, I've noticed, and, and I've no choice but to follow. We approach the stairs and by just looking at them, I get the sense that we're crossing some sort of line here. There may very well be no way back. Well, continue. That looks scary. As, as I head down the stairs, I notice that they look aged. That damn ringing noise is somewhere below, louder than ever. I feel like I'm walking down into the cellar of a hundred of a haunted house. The light becoming scarce as the stairs take a slight turn. I can feel the temperature drop. Dennis makes it a few steps down before he is leaning on the wall. He's breathing like he had just finished the marathon. We have to keep going. We need to keep moving. I'd, I'd, I'd rather figure out what this place is sooner rather than later. As we keep going, my mind seems to lock in on the unknown fate of the rest of my crew. Frank is married and I met his wife a few times. A nice woman with a huge laugh. My heart sags a bit when I realize I might never again get to hear him belting out classic rock tunes during lunch break. Joe, well I don't, I don't know too much about him. He's 22 years old and it's considering community college. His folks are deadbeat so he has been providing for himself since the age of 16 or so. Out in the woods, regardless of their backgrounds or ages, I, I'm responsible for them. In the frequent visits of, to local bars after a long day, or away from families on this risky job, I'm responsible for them. Maybe we can still find them and still get to hear Frank singing in his deep baritone voice after a few too many drinks. I have to make Dennis stay behind me as I stick my foot out in search of the next step. 
I can't help feeling like a child as a very as a very powerful fear seizes me. I'm expecting a monster to reach out of the darkness, slicing into my throat. After what feels like forever, we come to the bath, to the bottom of the stairs. We're closer to the green noise now. A door sits securely in the wall and looks just as out of place down here as I feel. A, sil a slither of light seeps through, illuminating the area. The, the door has what looks like a panel with lots of labels and lights. Small embossed print above the panel says, says level one entrance gate, transport sector, and there's a button with no label. So, let's just push the button. Let's go check. Okay, nine minutes. I give the button a push. One of the readings on the panel flickers to life. Outage. That's all it says, and then goes dark. The panel looks like a diagnostic or alert system of some kind. Each label meant to commu communicate some status. Lockdown engaged. Experiment in progress. Shut down engaged. Those all appear to be off, but one of the phrases has slowly blinkering red light next to it. The only powered light on this whole thing. Abnormal entity breach. What the hell? I suddenly push the door open when Dennis suddenly steps in front of me, taking the lead. Let's go, he says. I want to find out what the hell this place is. As Dennis walks through, the ringing or beeping or whatever it is gets a little louder. The door closes behind us with a click. I can't help but notice the wobble in Dennis' step as he lets out a grunt. You, you, you sure you're healthy enough to keep going, Ask. It doesn't matter. I don't want to be in the woods right now. He seems scared. Something I've ever seen before. Angry, yes. Upset, yes. But Dennis is never scared. Well, what do you see? He must have seen something if he doesn't want to be in the woods. I don't know what it was, boss. It was like... It was like something had left a radio on, crackling, but we don't have any radios on the site. It was, I don't know, it was like something in the forest was moving. I gave him a doubtful look, and he cast his eyes onto the ground, frustrated. I know how it sounds, he says, but I know what I felt. It was like walking into a funeral parlor, feeling death and gloom everywhere. I've been so pre preoccupied with my own fear that I nearly forgot about the ring noise. And I become just background noise. We take a few more steps and I can now see where we are. It makes no sense, yet another thing that simply seems out of place. The shapes and muted colors of metal are easily to identify. But it just doesn't belong here. Well, that's the end of chapter one. Respect the dead. You and 36% of players left Tony's body where you found it. Secrets. You and 76% of players were upfront with Dennis about Tony's death. Trust. You and 55% told Dennis you believed his story. Curiosity. You and 25% of players ran away from the ringing sound. Well, so far we did not do so well. Well, it, it depends, you know. If, if this means we are average or unique but i think yeah really good story so i'll leave it here if you like this video like leave a like if you would like to share it sharing is caring and um if you'd like to follow the story stay tuned because chapter two will definitely come extremely very soon so um i'll see you all in the next video bye bye